<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Spirit Plant Medicine Weekly, Monthly, however we often we do it, when we do it. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever time of day it is as you're watching. My name is Mark Curran, and I am here with my good friend and host of the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, Stephen Gray. And today we are going to be talking about accessibility in the world of psychedelics as things are becoming more open and more legal. And uh, our good friends, Tom Hatzis and Eden Woodruff, who are in Oregon, in Portland, have corn coined a couple of great new terms that we're going to get into and dive into. Um, so we're really happy to have them here. And that's going to be the nature of our conversation. We have done things a little differently where we have invited people to join us here in Zoom, uh, where they can have an opportunity to be part of the conversation when we get into Q&A. And it's just a new format that I'm working with. And I want to see how it goes. So it's something you can look forward to as we move forward with these regular uh, podcasts, video casts, interviews, whatever you want to call them. So, Stephen, welcome. Thanks for being here, as always. <laughs> Good to see you. Thanks, Mark. Awesome. And we have Tom Eden and or Tom Eden, Tom Hatzis and Eden Woodruff uh, joining us, which is fantastic. And they've coined a couple of great uh, terms, as you can see. I'm going to move out of the way so you can see my image back here. Profidelics, which I thought was really fantastic. And I like their name in their conference, the Hey, What You Canference. <laughs> I love that too. And just the simple phrase that non-accessible is not acceptable. And that's going to be the focus of our conversation today as we talk about what's happening in uh, the world of psychedelics and therapy and things of that nature. So welcome to the program. Thanks for having us, Mark and Stephen. Yeah. I, I do need to clear one thing up. We did not coin the word profidelic. That's kind of been kicked around for a bit, but Eden did coin the pay what you can friends. Awesome. <laughs> well, you, you brought it to, to my reality anyways, and I thought it was really... Uh, timely and it made sense because some of the things that you know as an organizer of spirit plant medicine um Stephen and i have had many conversations around pricing and profit and accessibility and sustainability and i know that that's something that's near and dear to both of your hearts as well with the initiatives you have down in portland so maybe you can tell people kind of what you're up to last time we spoke with you we were talking about uh, your thrift store uh to support accessibility so maybe you can give us an update on what's going on. And you just got back from the conference in the UK. So maybe you can give us an update of the highlights there as well. Sure. Uh, you want to start off with sure. Sanctum Thrift? Sure. Yeah. So um, the last time we spoke with you, we were um, fundraising for our Kickstarter um, for the, to open the thrift store. And we made, we made our goal, um, thankfully, uh, with the support of you and uh, many others rallied together for that. Uh, the thrift store is a... Uh, nonprofit raising funds um, for psychedelic assisted therapy. So um, people who are interested in this medicine but find the price tag uh, much too high, um, we are offering grants um, for them. Um, in the state of Oregon, you know, psychedelic assisted therapy is uh, legal now. Centers are opening, but the centers um, for one session, it's up to $3,500. <clears throat> so we're looking at um, yeah, ways to fill the gap um, and support um, other organizations um, that are um, with the indigenous um, traditions. Um, Tom can say more about that. Yeah, the um, the first two, uh, we have two meetings uh, coming up in June for two different nonprofits. One of them is called Uphold Our Troops and their model is based around giving veterans uh, psilocybin assisted facilitator training. And they're going to branch out from that to start um, giving these life-changing medicines to vets. And so we're gonna be supporting them in those efforts. And another friend and colleague of ours, Joel Breer, who's in Mexico, um, he's a facilitator as well, but he's also uh, very much involved with an organization that works to preserve indigenous medicines. As I'm sure many of us know, peyote is in danger of, becoming, of going extinct. Uh, the Sonora Desert Toad will 
probably be extinct in the next five to 10 years if things aren't done about it. And I know some other people are out there working to preserve them. And this is another organization um, that aligns with our values. So we're, we're going to be helping fund them as well. And more to come as the um, as the laws and parameters for psilocybin or otherwise psychedelic assisted therapy broadens, we're going to be broadening our mission with how much the laws allow. Mm -hmm. What about um, I have so two questions of other ways of you know going at this that I'm just kind of wondering about if you guys have considered or are the, or or for which there are any options at all. And one is. Um, uh, you know, short of actual quote unquote therapy, uh, is it presumably it would be not expensive or maybe it wouldn't cost anything if you had a bunch of trained volunteers to be sitters. Have you, is that in the kit bag anywhere? The idea of having sitters? So right now, legally, the only way you can take psilocybin is in the psilocybin service centers with a licensed facilitator. So outside of that model, yeah, um, it's not legal, but um, mushrooms and all drugs actually have been decriminalized in the state of Oregon. So if you're caught with them um, and there's no intent to distribute or sell, then you'd only receive a $100 fine. Which is still ridiculous, by the way. Still ridiculous, but... But better um, than prison. It's better than right. prison. Yeah. And, you know, if the facilitator or trip sitter, as long as they're not the one providing the psilocybin there's really no risk to them right so i wonder what the I, police's attitude is there too like in vancouver it's they've said it out loud they're, they're deprioritizing right um you know paying attention to this kind of activity yeah we had a uh, a little bit of a mishap coming back from spirit plant medicine conference uh we got illegally searched at the border and um Due to the nature of our work and the things we're involved in, we happen to have a tiny little bit of psilocybin in like a little eyeglasses case or whatever it was. Yeah. And um, so that was pretty nerve wracking as we were sitting in the office waiting for them to decide our fate over this. And they called the local sheriff of whatever the town is in Washington. I forget the name. Lane, maybe. Lane. It could it, I I was yeah. just happy to get out of there to be honest with you. I, don't, I don't remember what it was but the 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 truly I mean magic the sheriff thing, say what the, here's what the sheriff said oh. he was kind of on Eden and my side he was talking to the Fed saying you know how he has mm -hmm. you know army veteran friends and police officer friends that actually are using psilocybin secretly because of its legal status and, you know, and also the um, uh, just the stigma around it. And um, so he essentially said that <laughs> he's like, I recognize these as the medicines that they are. I'm not going to bust you guys, but I have no control over the feds. But his message reached the feds and they ended up letting us go. And um, I uh, I don't know, that was pretty awesome that the message that all of us who are kind of doing the grassroots work, it is actually reaching the people, um, you know, in authoritative quote unquote positions. And they're seeing what we all see about these medicines, that they are life-saving and they do help with trauma and PTSD and things like that, depression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's just a great story of, you know, the border of all places because we know there is zero tolerance right yeah um yeah. and and that you know how long did that take that whole process take, take? <laughs> we were there for hours yeah it was like the middle of the night like i don't know three or four hours just sitting there like you know shaking just waiting and the fact that it was an illegal search in the first place didn't offer us any protection at all well just so people know can you maybe um you know, because I, I was always under the impression when you're at the border, they can do whatever the hell they want. So what makes a legal versus illegal search just as a sidebar? There has to be probable cause. I, I can't speak for how the laws work on the Canadian side, but once we enter the U.S. side, our the police officers need probable cause and that needs to be readily apparent. For example, they smell cannabis coming out of the car or they smell alcohol in the per person's breath. Um, we didn't have any cannabis or alcohol. 
And so there was no reason to search the car. Like we didn't, they, we didn't give them probable cause to search and they did anyway. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, it's a good thing you didn't go with that great big mushroom that I saw a video of. Uh, from the <laughs> yes. The the yes. <laughs> yes. Very good, good thing, thing we did not try that to, to a friend. <laughs> yeah. There was actually this funny story though. Just what happened was, um, I went out to my car to just while they were searching it to get the little bit of money that I had because one of the officers like you want to probably get that so I went out there and as I was going that's when the officer pulled out the little case that had the mushrooms and he's like what's this and I'm literally wearing a name tag that with my name on it that says spirit plant medicine conference oh I don't know what those are (laughs) it's like well the name tag says otherwise (laughs) that's funny so, um, uh, you know, getting back to what you guys are actually doing, specifically, how do you intend to make um, <clears throat> this medicine accessible for, uh, you know, little or no money or make it accessible, period? Yeah. So the organizations we're working with, with um, so Uphold Our Troops, um, they the, the funds from the thrift store go directly to that organization first um, with the facilitator training. Um, training vets to become facilitators, and then they're going to move into scholarships for vets to um, also receive the uh, psychedelic assisted therapy as well. We're looking to also work with other nonprofits Mm -hmm. that make it accessible. Um, There are more and more popping up, so we're excited to work with them, not just with psilocybin, but with um, ketamine assisted therapy and um, hopefully soon MDMA assisted therapy as it's like slated to become legal federally pretty yeah. soon we hope yeah it's it's pretty much in the leading the race right now between mdma and psilocybin and mdma is far further along to becoming mm-hmm. federally legal and here in the states ketamine is already legal so we we reached out to another organization a nonprofit that does uh ketamine assisted therapy and we're just waiting to hear back and sort of hammer out the details of you know how we can move forward for uh, for people that aren't familiar with the effects of ketamine or how it works in therapy, have you guys taken it yourselves? And do you know how it works that way? I've heard remarkable things. I'm actually interested in trying it myself. Um, I've heard remar- remarkable things for treatment resistant depression. Um, and uh, yeah, great testimonies. Uh, we have some uh, facilitators at our uh, healing center here in Portland. Um, so yeah, and they're also working within that, um, organization that we're trying to raise funds for. Yeah. I don't personally have any experience with ketamine, but I do have experience with henbane and mandrake and they're kind of similar. That's a pair of comedians, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Hendrik and Mandrake. (laughs) Yeah. The psychedelic and entheogenic. No. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I, 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 I've had experience with ketamine. Oh, uh, I sat in ceremony a couple of times. It was done in a ceremonial setting. Uh, it was a group and it was intramuscular. Uh, oh. So it was actually injected. Um, oh. And I got to say, <laughs> I was I was hesitant. I was unsure. You know, you know, I've heard things both good and bad about ketamine, you know, in terms of like just you know, from the people who do it from a recreational point of view to a therapeutic is very different. And I've heard so many stories on all of that spectrum. And I got to tell you, it was one of the most peaceful, enjoyable, just there was a, a disconnection and a oneness. It was like I was just I was took me outside my body. Mm-hmm. And I was just at this level mm-hmm. of peace where I was still conscious. I was still fully aware. But I had this disconnection that just felt like uh, like a rest it was like a deep rest that was just so uh, it was like a very very deep meditative state yeah sweet yeah they call it a dissociative um Mm -hmm. actually yeah so um on the notion of what mark just said about uh you know the good and the bad as it were um uh I have heard, and I don't remember the details, but that there's been some press, which isn't good about um, like more, I don't know, more addiction, more crime, more problems since this decriminalization thing has happened in Oregon. Um, And and if that's true, uh, as I say, I just breezed a 
upon a couple of things quickly. Um, that would seem to potentially be, um, you know, putting some brakes on the forward movement of all of all that. What, what do you guys think about all that? Well, one of the things that we weren't allowed to do or we weren't allowed to say during the campaigns to get these um, medicines decriminalized is that there is a difference between certain drugs and others. Um, we were more or less made to pretend that methamphetamine and cannabis are essentially the same thing, uh, which is interesting because I remember not five years ago, we were all saying, how could the FDA be so stupid as to put cannabis as a schedule one? Well, somehow the, the script has flipped and now people are saying, well, it should be, they're all the same thing. And I know it's an unpopular opinion, but I don't believe they're the same thing because I have never met a person that tests their fentanyl just in case there's some psilocybin in it. <laughs> I don't yeah. know about too many ayahuasca related drive-by shootings. I, I don't know of any of those. And sorry, it was a well-meaning, uh, yeah, yeah so. uh, movement, but there, there, there hasn't been the support in place. Um, like the, people were using Portugal as a model, but you know, it, in Portugal they have uh, injection safe injection sites. Um, they have more supports, and there's actually like social pressure to not um, to do these uh, hard drugs in public. And and here uh, and you'll you'll be arrested in Portugal, uh, you know, for creating an open drug scene in public. And and here they've just gone rampant. The police are overwhelmed. They don't have the resources. So it wasn't uh, rolled out uh, very thoughtfully, unfortunately. And so there is a lot of uh, blowback now because of it. And I understand it. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Um... A lot of people thought that with decriminalization, we were going to get naked hippies throwing a frisbee in the park. Instead, what we got are hard drug addicts shooting up on our front porch. Mm. And it's because we weren't allowed to say, hey, let's decriminalize things like mushrooms, ayahuasca, iboga, those sorts of things, uh, true plant medicines and fungal oh God, medicines. What's that? Nice. Something came in there. None, we didn't say anything. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there was an uh, alien voice came in. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, that that is terrible, isn't it? You know? Well, just... it's just that these people need help, not encouragement to continue living dangerous lifestyles. And we both have a lot of compassion for this issue. Mm -hmm. But how we go about it, you know, it's going to take a little bit of truth and maybe perhaps some mm -hmm. tough love but it's done because we actually do care and giving, you know, somebody struggling with these substances, essentially my tax dollars to go buy those substances <laughs> is really not the best strategy in my opinion. Is there a best strategy? Yes, I think that we should be allowed to say that there are major differences between ayahuasca and heroin. And I'm not saying that uh, like when when people talk about psychedelic exceptionalism, they don't mean that psychedelics are exceptional or people that use psychedelics are exceptional. What they're saying is that some of these things are very obviously more dangerous than other ones. And that comes down to the individual. I know plenty of people who have drunk ayahuasca who are absolutely insufferable people. And I also know <laughs> no. I also know a few recreational heroin users who are good fathers, they're great husbands, they're uh, standout members of their community, they have good jobs, and, you know, they just like recreational heroin use every now and then. So it's like, I don't want to make it sound like it's the substance itself that determines, it's anything, it's the individual's relationship with a substance, and it's just based on what I've seen, it, it's far easier to fall into the harsher sides of these substances with certain things like methamphetamine, crack, and heroin than it is things like cannabis, mushrooms, or ayahuasca. Of course. And I, I don't know anybody who is going to a heroin facilitator because their ayahuasca addiction is ruining their life. 
I don't know who that person is. And until somebody can show me just one person like that, I am going to continue to believe that there is a difference between these mm -hmm. different kinds of substances. Yeah, it goes without saying, totally doesn't agree. it? Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. and what you're speaking to is just common sense based on what's out there. And uh, are you familiar with Carl Hart's work? I am. Right. I, am. I saw him speak here in Vancouver one time, and it was just brilliant because he was basically talking about what you were talking about in terms of the responsible, all the people who use substances responsibly that you'd never know, even when you told your story about crossing the border. Right. Yeah. You yeah. know, what? these people are using these things responsibly, but you wouldn't know doctors, lawyers, you know, professionals, whatever that may be, judges, mm -hmm. all of that thing, all of those. And yet it's the stigma of what we see on the street and the damage that it's doing. And then we see that even the programs that are out there for, you know, substance abuse aren't working. And what do we see that works? Plant medicines, mm -hmm. right? Iboga and, you know, ayahuasca is, you know, powerful with addiction as well. You know, so it's I, I think it's the tides turning and it takes these conversations and real time um, research, which is what I love about what's happening now is there's so much research out there that is now being able to prove it for all the psychedelic or the the scientific minds and and things of that nature that I think, you know, is important as this moves forward. But what mm -hmm. we're seeing and we all know, because it's what we're, you know, the world we live in these days is there are tangible, measurable results. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. All right. And that's where you're saying, and this is what I love about what you're saying about accessibility. You know, as we all know, mushrooms aren't expensive. If you, you know, you can go pick them and forage them as a, you know, as a animal of nature, right, as a human being of nature. Um, that it doesn't subscribe to these laws. You know, the bear can go eat whatever it wants. The, the deer can go eat whatever it wants, right? Mm -hmm. but it's not illegal for them, but it becomes challenging for us. Right. And so accessibility, when you take a look at the mass populace, it's one thing people who have the means, but today we're at such a, a challenge within the economic climate of, you know, the world really, that there's a lot of people who, could benefit from this uh, work, this therapy, this medicine, whatever we want to call it. Yet mm -hmm. when all of a sudden it becomes 1200 bucks for a session or $2,000 for a session, how does that yeah. person who's making minimum wage or just struggling to get by afford right. it? Yeah. Right. I, I think that, you know, things are going to morph and change. I think that this is a brand new world um, with psychedelics. And I think that the, the current model it's, we're, we're people are are working it out and we're going to fill the gaps where we can i totally support decriminalization and people learning to grow their own uh friends sitting for trusted friends um another thing we also raise funds for is integration support and education um so um you know the funds we raise they go to help make our conference accessible all of the um, integration circles we hold monthly and the talks that we give, we try to make those as accessible as we can. So as you know, Mark, these ex experiences, the, the, the real work begins after the experience. And so, uh, you know, we're there uh, every week holding our open mic, creating community. And so, um, yeah, it's about creating the community and the structure to support people having these experiences as well. That's a big part of it. It's wonderful. Yeah. So, so you mentioned your conference that's coming up again here, July uh, 21st to 23rd in the wonderful city of Portland, Oregon. I had the pleasure of being there for your last one in mm -hmm. 2019 and it was, it was fantastic. And unfortunately I won't be able to be there in person with you this year because, you know, unlike you, your, your American guys don't let me across the border of the right paperwork and my paperwork lapsed over, um, over over the COVID seasons and it Aww. takes a year to get it done and a mm -hmm. funny story just as a funny story for all those people out there listening especially in Canada it was one joint when I was 18 that stops me from crossing the border oh one joint it's right? ridiculous isn't it yeah. oh, and it man. wasn't until I was 45 
be five years old, been crossing the border for years. Mm -hmm. And one day they just said, nope. And that was that. But I will be there in spirit. I know you're going to do an interactive event. So I'm going to, you know, hang out in your Zoom room and, and be the character that I am. But tell us about your, your event, the pay what you can, friends. I love it. Don't say it too loudly because Stephen might want to jump on board with that. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's just um, the pay with you, what you can, friends, is just an extension of our larger mission of making not just the medicines, but information about them accessible. So we are, we developed a kind of a, a new model for conferences, for a conference that is totally sponsor supported, that, um, you know, people, uh, different conscious businesses who agree with you know our stance that these medicines and information to them should be accessible to everyone and by doing that uh we're able to keep our ticket prices low and also somewhat high for people who don't have the financial means but would like to come and those who do have the financial means who by giving a little bit more ensure that the person without financial means can get in so essentially, those who buy a higher ticket, you're, you know, thank you so much uh, for coming, but also thank you again, because you just made it possible for somebody else who doesn't have the financial means to come to. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, I think there's a $50 tier, a 75, 125, mm -hmm. 250, and 500, mm -hmm. because it's also a fundraiser for our uh, Sanctum Thrift and Psychedelic Education Center. Nice. So tell us about the actual conference, like what's the format, et cetera. Sure. Um, do you want to go for it? Or do you want sure. To well, it's, it's, well, it's two full days. Um, talks about 20 speakers. Yeah. It, yeah it about 20 speakers. About that, yeah. Um, Stephen Gray will be there. Stephen will be one, one of them. One of them. Um, Dennis <laughs> McKenna. Um, the Dank Duchess. Acacia Lewis. Acacia Lewis. Petey Newman. Kobe Michael. Baba Masha. Baba Masha. Um, I, I love the that Baba Masha. Is Baba Masha going to be there in person? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Stephen, you got to connect with this woman. I saw a, a uh -huh. film on her on YouTube uh, maybe a week or two ago as I was just doing my own research. She's very quite interesting, and she's oh, yeah. big on the uh, Amanita uh, mushroom, if uh -huh. I remember correctly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Tom wrote the that. forward to her book. No, I didn't write the. I wrote an oh, endorsement. Endorsement. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. I, yeah. I'm not forward worthy yet, but uh, <laughs> I'm still on endorsements. But I'll get there. Is um, that um, is Amanita um, worthy of a lot of conversation? Like how? Ex speaking of accessibility, very. Um, mm. How how many people are likely to be able to make use of it? I think lots of people can make use of it. It has tremendous medicinal value, uh, especially for minor aches and pains. Uh, it, it pretty much cured my sleep apnea. Um, it's also good for cuts, bruises, itching, burning. Uh, people make Amanita ointments, rub it on, and it's like the itching is just gone. Um, uh, in fact, we tried it out with uh, our friend Martin Ball when I was in Ashland recording the witch's ointment. Um, he had gotten some kind of skin rash or something that was just driving him crazy. And we put the Amanita on it and the, the itch went away. The redness was still there, but the annoying part, the itching was gone. And it's been, um, there's been reports of it being really helpful for people in recovery. Oh yeah. Um, mm. uh, Amanita Dreamer is another big voice uh, for uh, Amanita Muscaria on YouTube. And she swears by it for helping her addiction to benzodiazepine. Wow. So, but, but, yeah, yeah, benzodiazepine. So, um, yeah, I think it holds a lot of promise. And that's what the book is about. Baba Masha's book yeah. is um, the studies she did yeah. in over two years and, um, yeah, how it helped people in a variety of different uh, different ways. So, yeah. so the, are these more like psycholytic type doses? You know, you were describing, you know, topicals and different things like that. And obviously, it has a historical, um, a somewhat fraught historical um story as it were you know that it can be quite uh, poisonous um uh, you know and also i don't know psychologically dangerous for some people what do you know about that aspect of it so as far as it being poisonous it's uh, the omnita muscaria is poisonous the way a steak that hasn't been cooked could be poisonous as long as the omnita is prepared uh which essentially just means drying it just dehydrating it then they're 
that's it's not it's not going to harm you. As far mm-hmm. as the different dosages that Baba Masha's survey um, sent uh, 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 aimed to tally, um, it was everything between like 0. 0.05, so like a microdose, and upwards of you know like a, a full on you know Terrence McKenna hero dose and everything in between. And what kind of effect? It's it's quite different. It's not a tryptamine hallucinogen. It's not a phenethylamine or whatever that word is that I never quite pronounce right. <laughs> it's um it's kind of closer to like people would call it a disassociative a per- deliriant. Yeah, or a deliriant, maybe somewhat similar to ketamine. Um, again, one of the reasons I've never done ketamine is because uh, before I mentioned henbane and mandrake. Uh, I also do ayahuasca. Oh, I, I, wow. Amanita muscaria uh, almost every day. Really? And um, actually, the other night, uh, as far as effects that are kind of odd, I was laying in bed. I took a pretty sizable dose and I was staring out my window and had the window open, this very beautiful, cool spring going into summer breeze coming in. And I was just enjoying looking at my, my window. And then I was like, wait a minute your eyes are closed. (laughs) And then I opened my eyes and it was like the same thing that I had been looking at was all right there. And I was like, what? Like, but it's, uh, Almanita can be like that. It's, it's, it's interesting like that. Um, and I would say that you absolutely can take entheogenic doses of it. Some people will say that it's not entheogenic. They haven't taken a high enough dose, in my opinion, because I have, and I've had, I had one of the deepest entheogenic experience of my life about a month ago with Amanita wow. Mascara, or yeah. two months ago, hmm. about now, yeah. Great, well, that was another great sidetrack on that subject. I, I think mm-hmm. there's a lot we can talk about because I, I think it's not all, often talked about as much as it could be. And it's something I know, living in Vancouver and BC, you see them growing here every fall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right on the campus. Yeah. And learning how to get that medicine into the people's hands. It's great that that's still legal. We go foraging every year. It's our favorite thing to do in the fall. And I love to educate people. I see all your posts. Tom, keep your pants on. No, (laughs) (laughs) I can't help myself. I love this mushroom. (laughs) Well, it's one of the things I love. Come off. um, Is is your playfulness. Right. What's that? Uh, So, one of the things I do love about you is your playfulness. Oh. Thank you. Fantastic. So uh, I know we went on a sidetrack there, but more about the conference. That's not a sidetrack. That's part of their conference. Oh, okay. Well, you know, uh, good point, Stephen. Thanks for, uh, you know. One point for me. (laughs) (laughs) Not that we're keeping points, because I don't know how many I have. Anyways, um, (laughs) so what more? This starts on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I think Mm -hmm. we got to Baba Mosh. Baba Masha yeah. on your on your speaker uh, list there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Uh, Solana Booth, um, who I believe had uh, spoken at SPMC. Um, absolutely, yeah. you, I don't have to tell you how wonderful she is. Absolutely incredible person. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have uh, the ketamine ca- Kasi, uh, uh, oh, panel. Uh, yeah. Panel. We're yeah. having uh, the are some of our um, ketamine therapists going to, they're going to be speaking on ketamine uh, at the conference. Um, And then a psychedelic arts panel um, at, we're, we're hosting this at the uh, beautiful Haven slash um, Jaja PDX in Portland. And um, it's a gorgeous visionary art collective. So we're going to be, yeah, having a panel with uh, some of the artists there and cacique yeah cacique antonio uh has a really one of the most remarkable stories i've heard in a while he's uh from the inner city in new york and he chose mushrooms over the trappings of inner city life and um helps others kind of escape those trappings through entheogenic experiences so i'm really excited to have him out here and absolute Mm -hmm. sweetheart of a guy Hmm. Um, yeah, and I'm a very, I'm very excited for the cannabis ceremony yes. on Saturday night. Yeah, um, Stephen will be hosting a mm-hmm. cannabis ceremony on Saturday night. So we'll have, you know, the, the range of talks. We'll break for dinner and then we'll come back and Stephen will lead us all to further enlightenment. Just like the ones we've been doing at the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference for the last three or four years. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> if anyone who's watching or listening to this has been to that conference, they'll know what we're doing for that. Yeah, and it's, I, I think it's a beautiful way because one of the things that 
you know, I, I always believe experience is the best teacher. We could read all the books, we can memorize and study as much as we want, but it's a, more of an intellectual based um, recitation of information versus an experiential intake of the information that creates the experience that then leads to transformation. And that's one of the things that I love that we started doing at the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference back in 2018, because it had just become legal here in Canada. Mm. So we had that great opportunity um, to do that and to hear the feedback from people and the experiences that they were having. And it was something else to see all, you know, all these high profile speakers and everybody out there in this, but everybody's out there you know, imbibing and enjoying the sacrament of cannabis uh, for the ceremony. And I think it's always a great way when you can bring experience in to these conferences. So Stephen Gray, good on you, my friend. Yeah. Well, Tom and Tom invited and I said, yes. <laughs> I, I always loved the ceremonial aspect of SPMC. Yeah. Like I, I, I remember the first year I attended, I think it was 2017. In the old um, room. In the back of the old yeah, room. Yeah. And yeah. that year there was like a, a ring at the very end and like oh uh, uh, yes. Yeah, people held hands and went went through um there was yeah, like a the building snake dance of sorts, didn't we yes. all join and dance all the way around? Yeah. Right. I think that was uh, just... Kateri Walker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. And I just came home from that weekend and I was buzzing. I was it was mm. I was so high from that experience and that nice. really changed my idea of what a conference experience could be like. And I really love that. And I'm inspired by that. And I want to bring, I'm still in, I'm still in your, uh, yeah, these ideas are just too good and want to bring <laughs> it, uh, bring that magic in with us. Well, we're importing the idea. Importing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hey, if something works, do more of it as I always learned, <clears throat> you know, Absolutely. Model, learn from the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the giants of the shoulders we stand on, hmm. you know, and, and bring that experience. So, so that's awesome. Um, what, what else do you have going on? Is there anything else you want to share specifically that we want to touch base? I want to give an opportunity to our in-studio folks. We've got a few people here. Uh, if they have any questions, uh, I'd like to take some questions from the audience. Um, and if you do have any questions for those of you watching here in Zoom, um, if you want to turn on your cameras, raise your digital hand so we can see you. Uh, if you have a question for Tom, Eden, or even Stephen, it's a great opportunity. Even Stephen. Yes. <laughs> even Stephen. Even Stephen. <laughs> but that's great. And what um, when it comes down to the conference here in Portland, is there anything specific? If there's one specific thing uh that you wanted the world to know about this uh what would that be i would say that we can we don't we don't have to abide by the prophetic model and we don't have to abide by exclusionary practices and we just have to get a little creative as to how to deal with them um with these kinds of issues and we're hoping that if we can make this sort of conference model work that it will you know hopefully other psychedelic societies will adopt it as well to see that yeah this actually can be done in a way that's totally you know as accessible as it possibly can be for as many people as it possibly can be nice yeah um uh, on the logistical level uh you know, obviously, you've made it very affordable for people that don't have a lot of spare funds. Um, but for people that would come from farther away, um, do you have any suggestions for accommodation, reasonably priced accommodation for people coming into town? Yeah, we started looking at a few hotels, and I just have to look at a few more. And we'll be putting, you know, we'll be releasing that when, when we have one that's you know, just a, a better option. And by better option, I mean, close to the venue, but also inexpensive, but not cheap, but just affordable. Are there any decent hostels there? Um, there used to I be, know. I, um, the Hawthorne one was right there. I'm not aware of any off the top of my head. 
Um, yeah, hostels. Yeah, I'm not either. Okay. I well, just looked in my car. One of the great ways I found um, that always worked for me when I travel is, you know, in the different Facebook or social media groups, you get a group of people to like Airbnb a whole house, mm -hmm. right? And it gets to be very affordable. <laughs> You get a nice place to stay and you get to meet some really cool people. So it's just a suggestion for, for people out there looking <clears throat> because if we talk about inclusion and community building, that's certainly one good way to go. Mm -hmm. Right. Truth. Absolutely. So Tom, we have a question from Karen S. She says, going back to Amanita, she'd like to know how you uh, used it to cure your sleep apnea. Oh, I didn't have to do much at all. I just had to take uh, Amanita before I went to sleep. That Any was pretty much it. That's a great question. But what's that? Any specific dosage that you were taking or? Yeah, I would usually, you know what I have them right here. Um, usually a spoonful, like a small teaspoon about, not, not too much. Um, you'll also have very, very vivid and lucid dreams um, from Amanita muscaria. And um, actually working on a book right now that kind of, goes into all that and how to use sort of um, occult technologies and sort of witchcraft along with uh, mushrooms like Amanita <clears throat> muscari and psilocybin to get the most out of them. Well, since we seem to be um, encouraging uh, <clears throat> granting entry to um, Amanita into the psychedelic pantheon, um, <laughs> uh, are there more specifics that you might tell people about how to make sure they're being safe with this and that they do prepare it properly. Absolutely. And, so, and add, can I add one thing to that sure. question? Because it, it can be, because I understand that there's the, the true Amanita and there's like a one that wants to be an Amanita when it grows up or something like, <laughs> like there's one that looks like it, but isn't, is that true? So one of the awesome things about the Amanita muscaria is that there are no known deadly lookalikes. I mean, the ones that are propped up as deadly lookalikes would be the Amanita Wirosa and the Amanita Phalloids, and they don't actually look anything like an Amanita Muscaria. And some have brought up um, Russula Medica as well as an Amanita lookalike, but it really doesn't. Um, I, I mean, that's one of the, like, the thing about Amanita Muscaria that's so awesome is you know when you're looking at an Amanita Muscaria. You know, it's like, would a Smurf build a house out of it? Yep. Well, then it's a nominated muscaria. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then you uh, cut it off at the ground and then what do you do? So the best way to stay safe as far as with Amanita, Amanita, like uh, uh, Eden brought up our friend and colleague, Amanita Dreamer earlier. And one of the things she says that I agree with is that the Amanita muscaria is an advanced mushroom. It's not like mm -hmm. psilocybin in that uh, psilocybin mushrooms by and large, um, like a psilocybin mushroom that's this size and one that's this size will have the same amount of psilocybin in it. Um, whereas with Amanita muscaria, you could find a cap this big, like a, a big Amanita muscaria and one tiny one right next to it. And that tiny one is loaded with ibotenic acid, which is what's converted into muscimol during the decarboxylation process. And the larger one won't have much ibotenic acid in it at all. So the size can be deceiving. How you get around that to stay safe, or at least how I do it, is I pulverize. After the mushrooms are dried, I pulverize it because that homogenizes the dosage. Right. And so you want to get, yeah. So we bought a $40 dehydrator and put it in for about eight hours. Yeah. at the highest, almost as high as setting, 165, I think, 165 uh, Fahrenheit, right? Um, I don't know. I just, and, 165. Okay. <laughs> and um, until it's bone dry, it has to be bone dry. And that's when uh, the ibotenic acid is converted to muscimol. Yeah. And so that's when it's safe. It's not going to make you, uh, your stomach yeah. upset, um, but it's still going to give you that experience depending on, yeah, how much you take. Yeah. And it's, I would also say just with my own experiences, it's a little, you're more likely to have what we call an oops moment 
with dosage with Amanita muscaria than you are with other things, because again, it's highly erratic, like as, as far as like, there's no uniformity to these mushrooms and that's what makes them advanced. And what I did, and this is how, I mean, I, I would uh, uh, suggest to anybody interested, when we first went Amanita picking, I didn't eat them for a while. I would sit with them in my lap when I meditated. I would sing to them. Eden and I would make art and make like they do these photo shoots that Mark was talking about earlier with them. I just opened the door to that conversation. And it was only like after doing that, that as I like to say, the mushroom spirits finally started talking to me. And I started off again with just, you know, a small little teaspoon every night before bed, specifically for sleep apnea. And um, I also happen to love the taste. Um, there was one night that I had to give Eden my almond because I was just like, like, uh, like an ice cream, you know, kind of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, so then I would start to slowly introduce the Amanita to your body. That's what I would recommend. Don't try to go for a big dose right away. Your body does need to get used to it first. You want to so form build up a, yeah, a, a relationship, system. really. You want to have a relationship with it first. And so then it shall reveal all its secrets. So what? Uh, I don't mean to go too far to the negative here, but if you overdo it, what's the problem with that? What could happen? You, I mean, you might feel like I have overdone it um, in a way that I, I have had one pretty negative experience with Amanita, but I was also, I was smoking cannabis on top of it and I was also drinking um, oh, no. alcohol on top of it, which was not <laughs> oh, intelligent no. at all. <laughs> Terrible oh, combo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was not smart at all. So I don't really blame the mushroom or the alcohol, the cannabis. I blame me for having done something so foolish. Right. But, um, with my experience overdosing on Amanita muscaria, I pretty much lost all motor function and coordination. And I really had to go to the bathroom. And I was pretty much on this sort of adventure because we're on the top floor here. And there's one bathroom that's downstairs. And I was essentially squiggling and slithering like a worm across my house <laughs> trying to get to the bathroom. And um, it was... Uh, there's, I experienced vertigo, which was not fun. So like trying to slither to get to a bathroom while everything's kind of spinning around you was not fun. Um, I never felt nauseous though, which is, uh, it's interesting because that's one of the things people normally talk about with Amanita overdoses. They'll talk about the nausea, but I didn't experience that at all. It was mostly just like the, the vertigo and not being able to like control my arms or legs or anything like that as like that that sucked no, but, <laughs> no kidding yeah, yeah but it was you know again like that's one of many experiences i've had and it um again yeah. it was more my fault of stacking other things on top of it so yeah. i wouldn't say then that i've ever had a pure amanita amanita overdose yet mm. but you are cautioning people that way uh, yeah, absolutely. This is what could potentially happen um, right. if you take too much. So uh, just be really careful and make sure that you slowly introduce it to your body. I also jumped the gun. I was excited to take a psychedelic dose of it. So I took way more than I should have. And oh. um, yeah, again, it was just just my fault. So well, if we have time for another question, can you talk a little bit about proper dosages for psychedelic or for uh, psilocybin work that, that you're trying to encourage? Sure. It depends on what the person is going for. Are they looking for uh, a microdose experience kind of thing or like, a, you know, the cosmos opening up in your living room kind of experience? And for like the veterans, for example, I mean, what are you know, are there sort of recommended levels of that, you know, along that gradation? You know, people sure. that are experiencing PTSD, is it, do they need to have these sort of, you know, kind of like the Johns Hopkins work where, you know, you sort of have these breakthrough experiences mm -hmm. and you see that you're connected to the eternal source and right. it's all good and all that. And then you come back and you, and you feel sort of this total relief or whatever that is, right? Yeah, I think that's about an eighth is what they give. Which an is a, a cent, yeah, about an eighth. Um, an eighth so of a dried of a gram. No, three. No, and a half three. Gram. So a, a three and a half grams. Oh, okay, right. 
that's yeah. totally you guys so are Americans. You talk in ounces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Mark. You were uh, you were going to come in there. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you, Tom, for just your complete transparency and honesty and saying uh, it was me. It was my irresponsibility. I don't know. Oh, if you it was. Heard, uh, but I think it just it's it's important to acknowledge that and. Um, Vanessa had a comment uh, as well in the comments where she says that um, in regards to different substances, it's not just the, it, she doesn't think it's just the individual's use of the substances or the substances themselves that at play. Uh, U.S. and mm -hmm. Portugal have very different social structures, such as access to healthcare, poverty levels, and welfare systems. So, you know, there's a lot of, yeah you know factors into what absolutely makes. right sure. and when the bill was being proposed they were using portugal as an example but they weren't it's it wasn't the whole picture obviously yeah and so yeah if we had all those services in place i it would we'd probably be it would be a different landscape out here yeah mm -hmm. so and one one of the reasons why i pray and it's something that i'll, I'll definitely look more into of why I don't necessarily look um nah, never mind it, it's uh, not important yeah yeah oh well, we don't need to go into this but you know obviously um uh you know just the general addiction and and poverty and homelessness problem is a homelessness problem is a much bigger issue than specifically to do with drugs quote unquote right sure that's it's kind a, of what it's I an was... endemic problem that just it, you know is extremely difficult to deal with in you know modern uh, societies and you know their heads are always trying to go oh, I don't know, what do we what do we do with this you know yeah. affordable housing you know therapy you know whatever you know all these things yeah, yeah and, you gotta, you gotta look at I, what works right anywhere yeah. in the world what works and if there's one thing i think would probably all agree on from the studies and things that we see you know so many people grow up with trauma and challenges and everything that they face in life you know our, our society is so fractured that way yet community is seems to be what brings people together in that way where there's less usage even right so it's how do we take what we know works that we see in other countries and other communities and other practices and be doing more of that you yeah. know because there are homeless people out there who aren't on alcohol aren't on I drugs i was just going to say that they're yeah. just mm -hmm. don't want to be in the rat race they don't want to be in that sure right? but that is so, a minority no yes, yes it is yeah. I, that is a minority i, I agree very i'm much. saying yeah i'm, I'm very just much saying a minority. they are out there oh of course That's and i would saying. also this yeah. there's something you you touched upon mark that i agree with that i kind of wanted to say before but i couldn't think of a succinct way to put it but you kind of just did for me in a little bit there are people living in poverty that do not have these issues and there are middle class and above people who do so that's why I tend to, I, 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 I don't, I tend to leave that argument aside until there's no other explanation for something, mm -hmm. because there were so many other factors that just in my opinion, and I, I'm not, you know, the, the global authority on this or anything, but uh, from mm -hmm. what I've seen, there's um, poverty can play a role, and sometimes it doesn't play a role at all. And in other cases, a middle class life is literally what is playing the role. Somebody who has a job they don't like, they don't have a strong community. I think community is actually right. the most That's important. What I was yeah, going to add mm -hmm. is yeah, that community. community. I, I agree. I agree. And, more than everything. And, and and especially after an experience like this, yeah. and going back to a job you might be doing really well at financially, but you just can't stand, yep. and just having to go back to the grind, like you really Spiritually need. Bankrupt. A community that understands who you know you need to find the others at that point mm -hmm. and um and then you know um i think we can and, and collaborate with others and find new ways and that's what we're trying to do here is find new ways innovative ways to bring information to people and medicine so well it's fantastic what you're doing really you know it's it's yes. definitely um forward thinking you know one might even say revolutionary 
and we're always happy to share your work as we move forward in in, in what we're doing and you know creating a better everyday life for the many people that's really what it is and you know what works for some doesn't always work for others but we have Absolutely. to keep, you know it's change your approach that's the ultimate success for formula right know what mm -hmm. you want and then change your approach until mm -hmm. you get it mm -hmm. right yeah. and yeah. you know it's not about giving up it's about okay that didn't work what mm -hmm. can i what can i do next that yeah. didn't, or that might get you further along you know what can i do next and model and look what's worked for other people it's mm -hmm. one of the best ways is to see what has worked for others and see if that's something that works for you and that's yeah. all aspects of life right yeah and thank you so much for supporting us being a part of this thing yeah. the, this our last conference and this conference and yeah no, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's our Amazing. pleasure and Stephen's <clears throat> going to be down there doing what he does best which is going to be fantastic so maybe before we we sign mm -hmm. off because i got something i'm going to say towards the end as well um and i want to share sharon's uh comment that she put here as well uh, she's just a comment rather than a question because she's starting to see a sliding scale for ceremonial plant medicine offerings um, here on the west coast of Canada. And she's hoping that it starts to spread to make it more accessible to those with limited funds. So well, I that's think what it's a beautiful doing. segue. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for that, Shannon. But it's a beautiful Thank segue you, to maybe mm -hmm. put out another invitation for all of those people who are curious who want to know more and to meet people and build community within your events. So let us give it to us one more time, Tom and Eden. Go for it. What? Uh, we'll oh, invitation to your conference, the pay what you can for it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe contact me. info, like where people sure. look. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Exactly. So yeah, this July 21st to 23rd, we are putting on the Sanctum Psychedelic Pay What You Can Friends. You can find <laughs> out more information about us on sanctum.org. That's P S A N C T U M. So just Sanctum with a P in the front because we love psilocybin. Um, and it was obvious. <laughs> so uh, sanctum.org. Or if you go to Eventbrite and just put P S A N C T U M. Uh, sanctum into the search engine will be i think we're the only thing that comes up because we're the only people that don't know how to spell sanctum properly so mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and people can buy tickets right there online and, yeah people can yeah. buy tickets we have live stream tickets available and um again it, we have tickets as low as 50 dollars or as high as 500 if you would like to sponsor somebody else being able to get into the conference and you have the financial means um, this is the push and this is the time to show everyone that we do care about making this stuff accessible. And as we say, not accessible is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I just like to, you know, put my second that emotion, so to speak, by saying to anyone watching or listening, you could do far worse than supporting this. Um, it, this, this is an, a, an initiative that can change society you know step by step of course but you know it's a great way to spend a little money <laughs> yeah and, and and learn more you know if you're curious yeah I, I encourage everybody to you know and you you've made it affordable so you know it's definitely accessible for the many um and if you are watching this wherever you're watching this whenever you're watching this you're interested take a look around there are links to uh sanctum psychedelics.org somewhere around there in the event uh, i threw it in the chat for for the folks who are here with us in zoom and i just want to say not that i'm stealing your thunder but in the spirit of what you're speaking of because Stephen and i have this conversation so often about affordability about a sustainability and not about you know the gouging and making things expensive and you know as you both know tom and eden you know events aren't cheap to put on and costs are definitely going up we've seen that in spirit plant medicine as well and we always want to make things affordable as well so my thing i, I just want to put out there and this is just a nugget for anybody watching really after <laughs> after june 30th um I want to support what you guys are doing because we're offering 50% off early bird tickets right now. And if anybody's watching this at any time when those tickets are not on their early bird special and you're watching this and you want to get 
uh, an affordable price because you're limited as well, reach out to me directly at mark at spearplantmedicine.com and I will honor that 50% discount till the very end. But you have to reach out to me personally. <laughs> Sweetheart. All right. Well, we Mark likes to meet people. Yeah. And we want to, you know, we want to make it affordable and accessible just as you guys do. Right. Our goal is to, you know, not have to sell tickets at regular price because we don't want to do that because we, we know that it, it is limited for people. And we really want to acknowledge the work that you guys are doing and really your generosity in the way that you've structured your pay what you can friends. I just I love pay what you can friends. All this one right here. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, non-accessible is not acceptable. That's going to be a new motto that uh, I'm going to work with as well, if I may. Um, Excellent. Please, yeah, yeah, please do. It. I mean, we're stealing Stephen's cannabis ceremony, so yes. you could steal our not. Well, you're not. Money. You're not stealing it. You got. Oh, some, importing. You're we're importing. We're importing. <laughs> himself, who's uh, going yeah. to, you know, stand and deliver? Mm -hmm. He might sit at some point, but I don't know. <laughs> not yes. Although I hear we have to pay a little more because it's Canadian. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no worries. Well, it's copyright free. <laughs> okay. That's yeah. awesome. So I just want to thank you tom and eden for just for being who you guys are the way you show up it's just always such a pleasure to speak with you guys and get inspired tom we want to come back and leave a little cliffhanger for people um because i want to do a show with you uh, about the the leary files sure right and we can you know do something about what you're discovering in there um but we can you know that's a cliffhanger for a later date for people who are watching and Sounds steven good. always a pleasure to to have you uh um hosting with me whenever we're doing uh what we do always a pleasure and i want to thank everybody here in the community who uh took the time to join us in zoom uh karen shannon vanessa uh thank you so much and we'll look forward to doing more of these uh, in a way that we can invite our studio audience and our community to join us live in Zoom so we can get community involved so that everyone can be seen and be heard. So I thank you so much for, for the work you are thank all you. doing. Thank that you, Vanessa, good. Karen, and Shannon, also for your comments and questions. Yes. They were excellent. Appreciate it. Thank you. There's Vanessa there. Hi, Vanessa. Hey, yeah, Vanessa. I'd like yeah. you there. And Karen says, Vanessa. thanks Hi, for Vanessa. the fascinating conversation. Oh, there she is. Yeah. She's gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Flashing and I'm, yeah. Exactly. Until Alrighty. next time, take care of yourselves and be well. Thanks. You Shannon. too, Mark. Yeah. Bye Peace. now.